our speaker who hails from um, Wake Forest University. Mark is a, uh, a lawyer, but much more than that. Um, he's done extensive work in bioethics and the law and overlap with health policy. He's only written about 15 books and a bunch of articles, so it's a real sloucher. Um, it was my pleasure to actually work with Mark over the period of, of five to six years where we did a long-term project on conflicts of interest in research. It was a collaborative project with Duke Hopkins and Wake Forest. Mark was a stunning collaborator. Um, as sort of the last Greenwall uh, sponsored speaker, he uh, distinguished himself by flying himself up here. <laughs> because if, if bioethics wasn't enough, he is now learning to be a pilot. Um, and so I'm going to let Mark fly this uh, seminar series. Typical plan, he's going to speak until about 1 o'clock, and then we'll have 15 minutes for question and answers. In case you're wondering, yes, it is hot in here. Someone's tr trying to work on it, and uh, we'll do it. We'll fix that. Mark? Okay. Thank you, Gary. Uh, you promised me jokes. Come on. I mean, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. my gosh. I told you all the ones I had in the office. Yeah. Well, I... Uh, <laughs> What? You want to repeat? I repeat those. those. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There's a, it's a bar and anyway, uh, three characters. So, um, okay. So we know each other too well and, and had uh, a good time working together because we get each other chuckling. It. So it's hard, hard for uh, others to take seriously sometimes. So it's, we, it's good to keep us apart, actually. But in any event, I'm going to shift uh, to a, a more serious vein. Um, uh, not simply because of the topic, but I want to uh, remember uh, and introduce you to uh, those who didn't know her, a co colleague of mine, Allison Snow Jones, who um, worked with me on this project. And so I want to sort of dedicate uh, this talk and, and the work that I'm doing here uh, in her memory. She was an extraordinary person um, in, in all, all ways, but she was a health economist uh, who got her PhD here at Hopkins um, in, in, in public health and, and was on the, uh, I guess, the non tenure track faculty for a number of years. So I'm not entirely sure who else she worked with, but it was in the Department of Health Policy Management. And then we were very lucky to have recruited her to Wake Forest, um, and uh, she was a colleague of mine for mm, 10, 10 years or so. And unfortunately, we never worked together directly while she was there, but then since then she went to Drexel. And um, that's why she was, well, actually, just as she was leaving, we sort of conceived the project that I'm going to be presenting on. And, uh, and so she had a, a, an important role in, in sort of uh, motivating me to come up with this topic idea and sort of uh, uh, sort of take a dive into the deep end of the pool of uh, working on safety net issues, which I had not done before. I've always dealt with issues about the end, uh, those with insurance and, and, and didn't look at uh, those without insurance. And, but it was just uh, in her nature to sort of always uh, care deeply uh, about uh, the less uh, privileged uh, people in, in society, and uh, she brought her sort of considerable uh, heart and mind and soul to uh, all sorts of topics, but um, this one in particular. So I, I do, um, I'm sort of going overboard here because I think she is a very special person and a very special person to Hopkins as well, so I want to call your attention. And, and actually, so I brought uh, some um, uh, quotes. She was a blogger under the pseudonym of uh, Maxine Udall, a girl economist. I love her, girl economist. And, 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 and uh, everybody sort of remarked at sort of what a youthful kind of uh, presence she had with an old and wise soul. And I think it's uh, she, uh, uh, some of the comments that came out when, when it was announced that she had uh, passed suddenly, uh, sort of an unexpected and, and um, uh, fatal cardiac event that uh, people were writing and saying that she was brimming with new ideas and enthusiasm, which was certainly my experience that uh, she was a huge influence on people. I looked up to her a great deal. Her voice and intellect, humane, nuanced, uh, above all wise, were singular and irreplaceable. Uh, uh, I knew her only from her writing. I think I appreciate her original, thoughtful, and always sensible perspective on things. I love the way she managed to weave personal narratives into her economic arguments without ever seeming self absorbed, which is really, I think, uh, captures the essence. Genius, and uh, finally, uh, her voice is one uh, the world needed a lot more of. There are so few people who combine a deep appreciation of the power of commerce with moral indignation about its excesses. Taken into combination with her energy and deep academic knowledge, I think she was re regrettably uh, unique in our midst. So, uh, so um, that's um, I think a great way to start us into this topic, uh, remembering uh, her now. To shift gears a little bit uh, back into the humor frame, this is a parody of uh, you know uh, uh, President Obama's.
most uh, accomplishment with the, the Affordable Care Act. And so I premised the talk with sort of remembering that although it was a great achievement to the Affordable Care Act, it was a bit like uh, uh, President Bush, you know, appearing on the, the, the whatever it was, the aircraft carrier that, that, that right after the statue of, uh, uh, you know, toppled in, in Beirut and saying, you know, a mission accomplished. And, so any feeling that the Affordable Care Act is mission accomplished, uh, I think, is one that uh, I don't necessarily want to make fun of, but I want to sort of put it in the context of, well, it's, it is a great achievement, but it's not uh, where we need to be. And um, the, the, the reason, uh, with respect to universal coverage, is uh, well known to everybody in the room, but um, oftentimes to people, uh, not to people outside of health policy circles, but as, as you all well know, the Affordable Care Act is not about getting everybody covered, it's making everybody coverable. So its principal achievement is to forever rid the world of the idea of being uninsurable, uh, at least in the original United States. Um, uh, it, it's, its major sort of fundamental accomplishment is requiring insurance companies to accept everyone at average community rates, and then building the structures around uh, that requirement that make it feasible in terms of, uh, of uh, insurance exchanges and subsidies mandate. So um, the result, though, is not to uh, accomplish the goal of universal insurance, uh, because as, again, you all well know, there's 20-some uh, million people who will remain uninsured for a variety of reasons I'm going to uh, dig into in, 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 in more detail. But it, the, the Affordable Care Act greatly reduces the number of uninsured uh, uh, by over half some uh, more than 50 million, or roughly 50 million now, but a couple of years from now, even higher, down to uh, 23 or so million people. So reducing it in half is uh, sort of the biggest achievement that, um, uh, that we've seen in a long time, and it only gets us sort of halfway to the goal uh, of universal coverage. And so thinking of universal coverage as the aim here, um, uh, what else needs to be done to make the Corporal Care Act a uh, truly an accomplishment? Uh, of course, I don't need to remind you that it, even that is uh, assuming a lot because um, down here in the corner, I just parenthetically remind us that uh, reform hasn't uh, you know, happened yet and it still may not happen. So uh, we won't hear until the end of June whether the Supreme Court upholds uh, the individual mandate and along with it the rest of the Affordable Care Act and we won't know until uh, November if uh, we have a, an administration that's interested in implementing uh, the Affordable Care Act. So uh, it's, uh, I've always been more optimistic about the Supreme Court than, um, than others, and I've been proven wrong so far because I thought it was an easy case to uphold, as did most legal scholars, but uh, it shouldn't have come down to the wire with Justice Kennedy being the swing vote, but it's coming down that way, and I'm still cautiously optimistic that uh, Justice Kennedy will uphold it because he so clearly sort of articulated the strongest defense of the law in his questions to the, to the challengers. Um, and in my mind, to be able to articulate that position so well, uh, indicating he understands it, it's inconceivable that he could reject it because to me it's such a strong position. But then again, um, we tend to see the world differently. Uh, uh, not me, but you know, it's possible to see the world uh, differently, and, and, it's, and it's impossible to know for sure. But, but even if you say, okay, well, maybe uh, there's a good chance the law will be upheld, which is about as optimistic as anyone's willing to be, independently you have to say, is there also a good chance that uh, Obama will remain in the White House? And I don't mean to be overly politicized, but it's just a fact that uh, the uh, Republican opposition has no interest in implementing this law, and so if we end up with a, uh, an administration uh, from that viewpoint, uh, all the they don't have the votes in the Senate to repeal the law, they certainly have the ability to sign its, its implementation. And I don't know exactly what that world would look like, uh, the law in the books, uh, but uh, HHS uh, governed by someone who doesn't believe in the law, uh, but I have to believe it would result in the law not being fully implemented. So we have to sort of limit the possibility uh, that we will have this law, uh, but I would say at this point an equal possibility that we won't. Let's say you simply assign a 70% uh, 70 chance to the Supreme Court upholding and a 70% chance uh, to uh, Obama keeping uh, the presidency. Uh, most people say that's about as far as you can stretch the odds, but these are two independent events, so I'm told by statisticians that means that the cumulative odds are only 49%. Of, did I get that right? Yes. Uh, okay, thank you. So, so uh, you know, roughly speaking, 50-50 chance we won't have this law if my odds making uh, is correct. 
But um, that said, uh, even though it's uh, only 49%, uh, uh, the, uh, let's say that it's more likely than not it's going to happen. Let's remind ourselves that it still is on the books and, and ask ourselves what would the world look like if, you know, when the law goes into effect with respect to uh, the uninsured. So the question is, what more needs to be done to complement, to backfill, to dovetail uh, with what the Portable Care Act does do uh, to bring us closer to something we might call uh, universal coverage? Uh, and can this be done using uh, the safety net? I forgot to tell you that's actually what my talk is about. Okay, so there we go. Oops, 10 minutes in. All righty, so, um, so we begin by saying not so, so much who will be insured, and a, a lot of Portable Care Act talks that cover that already, but who will be left uninsured? Who's the leftovers, okay? And because that's what we want to focus on in terms of bringing all the rest of the boats up, you know, with, with the tide. So uh, over a third of the uninsured, uh, these are projections done by the uh, Urban Institute using their super fancy uh, uh, state-of-the-art uh, micro simulation model that uh, everybody seems to have one. Jeremy, you've got a micro simulation model, don't you? Three. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so uh, theirs is better than yours, though. But anyway, it's in there with the CBO and the Gruber and the Rand and whatever. So, um, so they ran these numbers, and, um, and they're roughly uh, the same uh, as the other microsimulation models, which probably means these are completely wrong if everybody's agreeing on them. But for the best that we know now, this is the best we can project. So a good portion of the remaining uninsured will be eligible for Medicaid. Simply haven't uh, gotten around to signing up, partly uh, possibly due to confusion. Rules change, Medicaid expands, they don't realize they're eligible, or they don't bother until they really need it. So, uh, so that will be a, a significant portion. About a quarter of the uninsured uh, project to be undocumented immigrants, and I assume you know that the Affordable Care Act does nothing uh, to uh, improve their condition. Uh, no subsidies, no uh, Medicaid, no exchange uh, eligibility for uh, un undocumented immigrants. Now, right now, they constitute a fairly small proportion of the uninsured, uh, basically half of this, uh, uh, but the numbers remain the same, but if you shrink the pie by half, their proportion doubles. And so, we can look at a world where uh, there's no improvement with respect to their situation, but they become a more prominent part of the uninsured uh, landscape, and particularly with respect to the low income uninsured. So we have to realize the extent the safety net for, is focused on low income uninsured. Most uh, folks who are truly low, you know, really low income, uh, who are legal residents or citizens, will become eligible for Medicaid, the, the first slice of the pie, or for um, significant subsidies through the exchanges. So uh, the remaining low income and uninsured almost by definition or default will be uh, undocumented. And so that will sort of characterize this population in a, in a somewhat different way than we're used to thinking now. Uh, about uh, over 15, uh, roughly 15 percent will be folks who remain uninsured despite uh, the individual mandate and despite being eligible for subsidies uh, because insurance remains unaffordable. Um, and so they are exempted from the individual mandate because that applies only if the insurance that you have available to you through your employer or through the exchange costs less than 8% of your income. Uh, now, if you run the numbers on <coughs> a sliding scale uh, subsidies you get through the exchange or if you project what it is the employers offer, um, you can sort of tease out, you know, who, you know, in this micro simulation uh, approach. Uh, what are the characteristics of these uh, uh, unaffordably uh, uninsured folks? Well, it turns out that they're middle income, they're not low income. Because if you're lower with income, uh, you get more uh, substantial subsidies. So these folks cluster in the 300 to 500% poverty range. And by, of course, that's starting to get well up into the comfortable middle class, I guess you'd say. Um, and so, um, 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 just the fact being, though, that you know you might be earning hundred thousand dollars, but your insurance might cost twelve thousand dollars. So that's you know right at you know about the eight percent threshold, or significantly above the eight percent threshold. And that is more likely to be the case if um, you're older. So insurance rating under the new rules is age adjusted, and so those in the sixties can be charged three times those in their twenties. And so this, uh, that will affect their, uh, how, they, how they qualify under the affordability exemption. So we had this sort of new segment of the sort of middle class folks with, of resource, with resources, with jobs and what have you, uh, homes, mortgages, cars, and all the rest, 
who presently are not thought of as being really served by the safety net, but who uh, arguably have a, have a claim to uh, some uninsured because uh, of this formula, you, you still can't afford it. Uh, and the remaining quarter will be folks who remain uninsured uh, despite having affordable options under this 8% uh, criterion. Some of those will uh, simply decline subsidies available to them through the exchange or their employer. <coughs> Others will just have plenty of money around and not bother to get covered. Um, and so this, this remains quarter. So as we sort of begin to look at what this landscape looks like, uh, roughly a third or more Medicaid eligible, about a quarter undocumented, about a quarter um, sort of violating the individual mandate, um, and the remaining 15 or so percent uh, uh, in the unaffordable category, how do we sort of begin to whittle sort of this uh, segment of this sizable population to sort of manageable proportions that we could begin to sort of address through safety net programs that might get us towards something uh, approximating uh, universal coverage? Well, we begin, so this sort of next line of thought is to begin to think about who really sort of counts as being sort of not covered, and it gets to the question of what does it mean to be covered. So I want to sort of introduce the idea that coverage can occur through means other than actually being signed up for insurance, that if you have uh, care available to you when you need it, there's a form of coverage uh, that uh, is uh, quite significant. Uh, it, 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 there's advantages to act, actually having gotten signed up to have got, gotten signed to it primary care physician to you know, have a medical home and to be sort of going in for regular care. But knowing that that's available when you need it, uh, in the same way that emergency rooms are, are available when you need it, um, I think gets us to a type of coverage that uh, I'm willing to count as being sort of virtually covered. So I sort of advance the idea that with respect to these Medicaid eligibles, they can be signed up at the point of service. Uh, they can actually be signed up retroactively, you know, sort of uh, back to the beginning of the first month or whatever. Uh, so you can pick up care that was delivered even before they were signed up, and they can be signed up right away. So if you have this sort of ability to sign to assign you to coverage uh, as soon as you need the services, or as soon as you think you need the services, that, in my mind, sort of goes a long way towards declaring someone as, as sort of virtually uh, covered in role. And my benchmark for this is to sort of think in terms of, as we look at the United States in, in comparison with our peer uh, nations, we say, well, in Europe, they have universal coverage because 100%, 99 or 98, so 98 is about as low as Europe goes, but we still say that's within the ballpark. Uh, we say, well, that counts, uh, they're, co they're covered because they're in a country where they're eligible for X or Y or Z based on their status. But nobody actually goes in and sort of dissects how they got signed up, they, do they just have their card in their pocket, you know, uh, and they pay their dues. Knowing that that's there when they need it is sort of good enough for government work, if you will, in terms of, of sort of a broad population survey. So I don't want to say we should just rest on our laurels here, but I just want to say in terms of identifying the problem, I don't see this as a problem about um, uh, sort of universal access. I think it's a problem about sort of outreach and navigation. It's a problem about optimal preventive care and medical home, you know, uh, situations. But uh, it, it's, it's a problem I want to sort of perhaps controversially, but take off the table as sort of part of our sort of numerator of, of uninsured folks. Um, so then we come to undocumented immigrants. And here it's much more controversial because when you say, <coughs> do they count as part of the denominator? Are they part of the population? Well, school can tell, they can't tell you that they're not part of the population. But if we look at, again, what our peer uh, nations do, do they actually count undocumented immigrants as part of their covered population? Do they actually cover them? And more often than not, they don't. So when you hear these, you know, French, German, East Spain, whatever, um, they have, you know, whatever their stats, the terminology is, immigrants, uh, legal, otherwise, naturalized, and what have you, temporary workers, guest workers, and all that. But if you dig into that, you learn that uh, with respect, and there, maybe the size of the undocumented population is not proportionally as large, but sometimes it is, in some countries it is. They don't actually provide coverage, uh, full-scale coverage to this population, and they don't uh, count that in their statistics in terms of hearing that 98, 99, or 100% are, are covered. So I by no means want to neglect them, but as far as sort of kind of just keeping score, there's an argument to be made that their lack of insurance shouldn't count against our 
drive towards universality. Now, it's not an argument I defend ethically. It's more sort of an argument I sort of want to put forward as, a, I guess, a pragmatic sort of political point that um, we doubt in the current climate we're ever going to get to a situation of having uh, you know, sort of comprehensive coverage for the undocumented. So can we just sort of footnote that, set it aside for now, and look at whoever the, the rest that, that, you know, sort of for which there's <laughs> some type of, 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 of uh, uh, achievable uh, goal that we might set our sights on. Realizing that with respect to undocumented, right now the social compromise it seems to be uh, fairly uh, uh, the lowest common denominator, if you will, that's uh, present in most states is to provide access to emergency care and access uh, to prenatal services. Um, and I think there are very strong arguments to suggest that that's not sufficient, that we should need to go beyond that um, and provide access to basic primary care and, and the like, and whether that should move on to or transplants and whatever is a tougher question to, to answer. But um, too big a problem for me to solve uh, for now. I'm just sort of flagging it and then sort of setting it aside with the observation that uh, with respect to sort of bringing ourselves up to the level of our peer countries, it, it's uh, something that we don't necessarily have to uh, uh, put on the, on the scorecard of deficits. So then if we look at the decliners uh, of the affordable options, the sort of individual mandate tax scoff laws, the folks who violate the law and what have you, um, clearly, they bring the numbers down, if you will. They continue to remain um, uncovered, uninsured, and don't have a good reason for it. Uh, we could intensify the uh, you know, penalties of the individual mandate, but that's obviously controversial. Uh, the question is, can we just live with them? Well, it turns out they only count for 2% of the population, if you take the 15% and apply it, whatever. So, even if we count them as continuing to be uninsured, and we've done the best we can to force them to get insurance uh, within the political legal constraints, it only breaks us down to 98 percent. That's all we're looking at. So, is that close enough? I don't know. But for this line of thought to sort of sort of congeal into this argument that I'm suggesting that maybe we can get to something that sort of would allow us to sort of collapse at the finish line, so you know, mission kind of kind of accomplished. I finally got my homework in time. Maybe I'll need to get a C plus, but I got it in. Uh, we would still have to deal with these unaffordably uninsured, and even though they're just two percent, less than two percent of the slice, it's you know it's a critical number for us <laughs> in terms of the scorekeeping. So, uh, what could we do for these folks that would um, that's sort of the critical uh, focus? So, realizing that this composition of the uninsured is going to sort of concentrate on this more sort of more middle income, middle and upper age folks. Um, but realizing that unlike the current situation, we don't know quite who they are. You know, it would take a lot of sort of dissecting to figure out who amongst us sort of has a pretty good reason for being uninsured if they're middle income and who doesn't. Um, who's a free rider and who's a legitimate uh, person in need. Um, you know, who really deserves sliding scale subsidies and, and uh, reduced or free care and, and who again is just taking advantage of the goodwill of the citizenry. So in a sense, I mean, that's very hard stuff to dissect and very kind of, but we will, if the AC goes into effect, have sort of a, uh, an automated process for making these determinations. Um, you can disagree with the criterion, 8%, 10%, 12%, 6%, 6%, whatever, but it's there, it's the law, and it sort of is rough enough for kind of uh, rough social justice, if you will. So this group sort of emerged as sort of a newly identified group indeed, and um, so what I want to then turn to for the remaining part of my talk is what? programs might exist that might serve their needs in a way that's uh, reasonably well uh, coordinated uh, and comprehensive. And so this now gets to uh, the work that I've been doing. Uh, so I've kind of set up the idea of why this might be important, why it might analyze you. Uh, this is now uh, what are the systems that could be uh, developed to meet their needs in ways that provide uh, adequate or decent, uh, the concept of sort of activating the concept of minim minim minimally adequate or uh, minimally decent coverage uh, that is not the same as insurance, but has many of the same attributes of insurance. Um, so there are programs that exist that I'll uh, identify in just a minute that have have all these features that screen people, and this is not yet for the middle income, but the current sort of population of low income insured for uh, eligibility, or is their income you know, within 150%, 200% of poverty, uh, are they actual residents of the community? Uh, and 
whatever eligibility criteria. But once determined eligible, they're given a card, an ID card uh, that says, you know, the corporate, you know, a, a name and a logo and everything. And that ID card uh, tells them that they are eligible for sort of uh, restricted but 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 uh, fairly comprehensive range of services, starting with the primary care medical home. So. In these programs that I'm about to introduce, they are assigned to a primary care doctor that's their medical home and keeps their medical records that does care management, care coordination, that uh, signs them up for prescription drug access programs. Uh, so pharmaceutical companies will make their expensive brand name drugs available to these folks that are or they get favorable Section 340B pricing uh, or um, to send down to Walmart and get their $4 prescriptions like, like the rest of us. So in some way, sort of coordinate uh, where they can have some type of reasonable access to prescription drugs as needed. And, and most importantly then, if they need uh, specialized care, uh, high-tech diagnostics or hospitalization, have arranged uh, a network of hospital specialists and clinics that will take these referrals on some type of uh, free care sliding scale basis. So the programs I'm about to introduce um, have, um, have these features. Um, um, that have um, attributes that feel a whole lot like insurance. And so my next claim is that um, if with these attributes uh, you're providing uh, you know, reasonably decent access to a reasonably comprehensive range of services, similar to the range of services that we enjoy through normal insurance, that counts as coverage. It's a sort of a direct access form of coverage. It's not an insured form of coverage, but it you know, what's so important about insurance is to get you access to the services. If you provide those that, that access directly, you've accomplished uh, the goal. So, what I'm now going to do is sort of these four case studies where I've looked at programs that are constructed in different ways uh, that have these attributes. And my slides are supposed to pop up one at a time. I, I did something wrong when I said this. Are, so, we're going to have to sort of dissect this one, one column at a time. But let me just sort of capture the idea of what I'm aiming at um, by reference to a couple of better known examples. So the VA, for instance, provides access to, uh, to veterans under certain different complicated categories, but for some, some veterans it covers sort of a comprehensive range of services. For other categories, you have to be, it has to be uh, service-related injuries. But uh, for those that receive sort of general full coverage, um, you know, to get this coverage, you've got to go to a VA facility. You don't get to pick any doctor you want, what have you. And, system and what have you, but it's considered to be good good coverage. Uh, and so if you have VA coverage, you uh, don't have to sign up for insurance in Massachusetts. You don't have to sign up for insurance under the Affordable Care Act uh, because it counts as coverage. Um, uh, whatever the credible, credible coverage, whatever the other phrase is. Uh, the same, more controversially, is true for the Indian Health Service. Uh, and we know the Indian Health Service is uh, significantly underfunded compared to the VA and these other programs, but uh, more so with respect to the specialist referral pieces, uh, less so, uh, they're, they're better funded for primary care and, um, and hospitalization. And again, you know, access, actually getting physically to the clinic or to the hospital <coughs> is a stretch because of the distances that have to be covered, but um, um, if the specialist referral piece were better funded, uh, there's a decent argument that that should also is a form of direct access service that uh, 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 counts as coverage. And in fact, uh, they are also uh, people eligible or enrolled within a in health service or exempt from individual mandate uh, likewise. So what I'm suggesting is that communities could develop these sort of coordinated comprehensive safety net programs uh, that would serve as de facto coverage uh, that if constructed the right way would help fill in the missing pieces uh, <coughs> behind with uh, Affordable Care Act. And so there's my thesis finally, so 30 minutes into it, but here we go. So uh, these four programs, Asheville, Denver, Flint, and San Antonio, two of them are based on traditional sort of public hospital based safety net programs. Two of them are based around community providers, uh, community hospitals and uh, physicians uh, spread around the community. Uh, the public hospital programs tend to be employed physicians uh, that work at these academic medical centers, faculty physicians, the, the other two, Asheville. Flint tend to be, you know, again, uh, more dispersed in, in community uh, practice settings. Uh, two of the programs uh, provide uh, virtually free care, the, again, the Asheville Flint. Um, uh, so to qualify, you have to be very low income, uh, below 200% poverty. But the, the other two programs 
also include uh, sliding scale structures that would reach out into the 300% uh, of poverty range so that they sort of contemplate uh, a more flexible sliding scale approach that begins to anticipate the potentially the ability to reach up uh, into the middle income groups. Um, and interestingly, three out of these four programs include undocumented immigrants. Um, they don't make a big deal about it, but they just say, you know, we don't card anybody, you know. We just ask for your pay stub, <coughs> your electric bill, that's all we ask for. And uh, we don't know who's documented and who isn't, just the same as you show up for the first day of kindergarten or first grade, you know, just if you live here, that's all we need to know. And so, uh, in that way, um, interestingly, sort of finessing the issue of, uh, you know, not making it sort of part of their sort of outspoken mission, treating people in the community uh, on an equal basis uh, without, you know, uh, you know, in a sort of humanitarian way. Now these are sort of models or ideals. I had to search the country high and low to found these four examples. They also have sizable enrollments, so that's why I decided to study them. It's a bit of a street light phenomenon. This the light is bright, it's shining here. But I wanted to start to study ideal or model programs so that it served my purpose well. Uh, each of these has uh, several thousand, and a, a couple of them have uh, you know, ten or twenty thousand uh, enrollees. Uh, they have been in existence uh, for a fair number of years, at least five years, so they were fairly mature. Um, and they were willing to provide me data, so that, that, that sort of means that it was a self-selected group of uh, high-performing, uh, uh, you know, uh, programs. So this isn't meant to characterize the general universe, by no means. These are exemplars. But the point is, is they're out there, and we want to sort of learn a bit more about how they function. So here's all the, here's all the answers, sort of, it's a numbers-based place here at Hopkins. Sorry, I didn't throw up some numbers. But, this compares uh, the access measures um, as between, let's see, let's see if I'm going to work in here. Yep. Um, so th this is a national survey of privately insured Medicaid <coughs> and all adults, and including children and all people. So you can use this as kind of norms for sort of the general access levels out there and decide if you want to compare to privately insured or Medicaid or or what have you. And so the measures you have are, you know, did you go to the doctor uh, any of the year? Did you go to a primary care visit? Uh, did you use the emergency room? Less use is better here. And did you use the hospital? Did you have hospital stay? So if we look at these programs, you can see that there's more physician use than here. Uh, now these are not risk adjusted, so these may be sicker people, or not, because some some studies say that the uninsured are less sick. I mean, they, they opt to not sign up because they don't see as much need. Uh, but looking at the gap of the difference here, um, you can start to get a sense that, uh, you know, maybe they're getting pretty good service here. If you look at the primary care visits, again, more usage than the, the general population norms. And if you look at uh, ER usage, you tend to see a higher level of use, but similar to the higher level of use for Medicaid folks who, uh, as well understood in the literature, continue to use the emergency room more than they should or need to because of uh, habits of, you know, patterns developed uh, during periods lack of access, uh, geographic access to providers in, in the locality or what have you. But uh, certainly levels that are not excessive uh, compared to Medicaid populations in general. Uh, the only notable deficit in these uh, kind of uh, survey figures or kind of skimming over the surface figures is uh, hospitalization. So you only have about half the rate of hospitalizations that you see across the population. So all, these all, all these numbers are for adults only. Uh, these programs that I've studied. Um, but the point is you get a sense that uh, looking at these objective measures, uh, perhaps there is a decent level of access. Uh, you can also look at it subjectively. So there's surveys that simply ask folks, did you have a problem getting care that you needed? Uh, uh, do you have a place to go when you're sick? Do you have social care? Those sorts of things. Uh, even if you ask them, do you have insurance? A lot, a lot of the folks in these programs falsely answered that they were insured because they were given one of these cards and they had all that traffic insurance. And some of the cards, like the Denver program, you can hardly tell the difference. You know, the, they say the same, they look the same, one's called it white, one's called it blue or something, but they just call it a box of money. So, uh, uh, so in these various more subjective ways, they also sort of conceive of themselves as being covered. So on those criteria, I think the case could be level of access. And then at what cost? So uh, this is the cost comparison. And um, here we are, uh, thanks to my uh, colleague Allison, and, and uh, we 
were able to do a more sophisticated job in terms of risk adjusting. So what we did is uh, take their actual sort of resource costs and define it in terms of the amount of care people used, assigning a market value or cost value to that. So this is not how much the program spent. Uh, a lot of these programs relied on donated care, uh, some reimbursed care, some reimbursed some care, but not all care. We just took all the care that was delivered and assigned a sort of a market value uh, based on uh, sort of prevailing rates for um, uh, institutional costs to value that care. And then we compared that to what it would have cost to have covered those same people by either Medicaid locally or by a private insurance plan locally. And to do that, we simply got uh, you know, local data, the local sort of side-by-side -side comparison, and, and did a risk-adjusted comparison. So we, we looked at Medicaid people in the same county, we looked at people at, at, at a private uh, you know, health plan, one of the larger commercial plans in the same county. So uh, it's, uh, the, the comparison uh, is consistent with respect to the base of providers. Uh, so for instance, in, in uh, the Denver program, we're actually looking at people in the Denver health system who either had Medicaid through that system or were uninsured. And so we're using the exact same hospitals and doctors in the exact same location. And then to adjust for demographics, we simply use the sophisticated risk adjustment programs that were developed in places like here um, and, um, and generated these pretty, uh, I think, uh, rigorous estimates of what it would cost to cover these folks under these programs and then compared it. So basically, these safe hand programs were using resources that were anywhere from a quarter to a half of what uh, the resource consumption actually was under these comparison programs. So the point is it's possible to achieve this level of access at costs that are a quarter to a half less than what we're spending through the full-scale programs. Now, it's a bit dicey to put that out there because it just suggests that you know, we should scale back Medicaid, just put everybody on the safety net, and you know, have a long explanation why that's not the take-home message because these are the exemplars, the highest functioning safety nets. And in many ways, they're more constrained. So they don't provide the same range of services that Medicaid and private insurance do. There are, there are li limits. Uh, they don't provide the same access, the same choice. But there are waiting lines. There are sort of implicit and explicit forms of rationing going on. But again, at levels that uh, I don't think fundamentally compromise the sort of basic decent minimum criteria, but aren't really at the same level. So a lot more could be said about that, but that's kind of the take home uh, message of uh, reasonably comparable access at substantially less cost, suggesting that perhaps it is possible once we sort of get, uh, you know, within sight of some mission that might be accomplished of keeping the Affordable Care Act alive, or certainly if it were to die, uh, this becomes ever more important. Because I mean, what we've learned here we're from the world as it existed prior to the ACA. So assuming now that the ACA does stay on the books, can we construct some type of similar program that meets the needs of those who sort of continue to fall through the cracks in a way that would bring us to this uh, ultimate goal of, uh, of uh, universal access, the Holy Grail. <laughs> and I remind you, smiling down upon us from above is our friend and colleague, Alice. And so uh, who, who could deny Alice, right? And so um, the, uh, not to make light of her, or her, her eventual fate, but the, the idea of the Holy Grail of universal access is still sort of eluding us, and it probably always will, but I want to leave with this thought that I think it, we see in these models the potential to develop uh, this complement to the Affordable Care Act, that given the political will, uh, the community resources, uh, and what have you, could be done. And it could be done in a way that actually includes the undocumented, that is, wraps together various components of need in the community that remain, uh, from the middle income uh, to the, to the, uh, the sort of the uh, most uh, uh, sort of political outcast. Uh, through this idea of the sliding scale, so that if you sort of say everybody pays according to their ability, uh, everybody qualifies regardless of, of condition, um, if, if they fit these categories of need, then there's a way of sort of creating a, a sort of a shared sense of community um, uh, need uh, that doesn't isolate or segregate people into these camps. So although I presented it in this sort of pie-shaped fashion, I want to sort of step back and say, what is the notion that sort of ties these elements together that says we, we still have a program that meets the, the diverse set of needs that identifies the folks who are eligible for Medicaid, gets them signed up, uh, tries to convince the people who have affordable options to take advantage of those, 
shows them how to use the uh, exchanges. Uh, and for those who still don't qualify, uh, can get them a primary care physician, give them a card, uh, put them in uh, reach of a referral access and a sliding scale approach that requires them to contribute something, um, or sometimes contribute something substantially, but in a way that doesn't constitute insurance, it that constitutes a patient go to a plan that um, uh, meets the diverse needs of these different segments. So that's sort of the grand sum of my optimistic scheme, and uh, so I'll leave it with that, and I invite your comments, and questions, insights, or uh, whatever uh, you'd like to share. Thank you very much. So I, I appreciate the distinction of, of setting ACA up as mostly health insurance reform right. as opposed to the universal access question. I think that's right. Uh -huh. But one of the concerns I have about what we're talking about today is that the way that states and the feds are financing it, as we're, we saw in Massachusetts, uh -huh. is actually weakening, ac weakening access to safety net um, right. hospitals and care. Yes. So in, in, right, in Massachusetts is maybe the the biggest problem that they're facing right now. Yeah. And so the, the percentage you said of undocumented immigrants that for some reason or another for, for these purposes maybe we shouldn't think about, I would say might actually be worse off because the block grants that fund local public health yeah. and other safety net actual health care yeah. is going to be pushed to Medicaid. No, it's worse than that actually because in my own institution, they're losing their dish funding, so they're cutting out bioethics funding. So I'm actually getting hurt. But aside from me, um, you're absolutely right. The the um, no the, the dish funding, the disproportionate share hospital funding under Medicare and, and Medicaid particularly is being cut way back. Under the premise that that was there for the uninsured. Now, you can argue, well, no, it wasn't there for the uninsured per se. It was for uh, you know the extra cost of treating the low income uh, who who have coverage. Uh, be more of them, so we need. But in fact, much of that dish funding has been put into programs that the certain needs of the uninsured, and so that funding will be scaled way back. And it's one reason the states, I think, are going to start pulling the plug on these programs, and that is going to leave, um, particularly the undocumented, worse off. You're, you're absolutely right. So I, uh, their numbers don't increase, but their situation with respect to access uh, will uh, almost certainly worsen. That plus, of course, the, the sort of uh, uh, sort of social and political climate in which these, you know, uh, the whole question of the, you know, uh, what they contribute to society and whether they should be here in the first place and whether we should be doing anything uh, is, is, is so much, you know, more of a, of a sort of a divisive wedge issue than it was, you know, even five years ago when, uh, or 10, 10, 15 years ago when these programs were set up. So. Um, so it, it's true that Massachusetts has seen, um, you know, reform has uh, made the situation more difficult for the safety net hospitals uh, because of these shifts in their funding. Um, the, um, uh, to some extent, that speaks to how well funded their safety net was before reform. So in fact, uh, under some accounts, the, some of these dish hospitals were getting uh, more uh, reimbursement for their uninsured than they were for their Medicaid. So when you move people off of being uninsured onto Medicaid, they were taking a, a hit. Now that's not true for a lot of other places. And so to the extent you increase Medicaid enrollment, even though you know the arguments were losing money on average, you know at the margin, you know margin of course average costs, uh, you're, 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 you're defraying uh, losses better than you were uh, by taking uninsured, uh, you know, for free. So. Um, it is a bit, a bit of a mixed bag. It's more complicated than what I portrayed. So uh, that's certainly a point well taken. I continue to elaborate on that, but I think it's getting, getting a little too hospital finance and not enough bioethics. Yes? Do, do you know what the four programs are planning to do in 2014? Um, so uh, I'm working with a couple of them, and they don't know. They're really struggling. They're struggling to even stay afloat until then. So. Um, the, um, so one thing I say is, well, just don't count any tickets until they hatch. I mean, uh, you know, don't get rid of us until we see, you know, sort of what the Supreme Court and the, the elections do. But some of them are actually 
there's a sense of, well, we, we don't need you anymore. And, you know, so they're, they're trying to stay alive until 2014, 2015. And then at that point, I think they're trying to figure out what their, what their recalibrated mission is going to be. Uh, a number of them, I think, are looking at uh, just getting out of the direct access. Uh, uh, they, they see the issue of the undocumented being too divisive, and they want to move towards care management, care navigation, so do they see their expertise and resources being, having been developed with respect to these hard to reach, hard to manage populations, perhaps being of commercial value to uh, some of the, let's say, the commercial health plans that aren't used to dealing with these populations. So that's one idea. But I am working with uh, the one in Asheville to develop this sort of model, the slider scale approach that would continue to be more inclusive and that would expand eligibility up into the middle income range. But it's, uh, from here, I, I'm going to go to meet with the board of directors on Wednesday to pitch the idea um, and uh, see if they'll buy it and see if the county will stay on board, see if the FQHC will stay on board. So it's really, it's, it's really tough to know what's, what's going to happen, even in that one uh, you know, location that I'm familiar <coughs> with. And, and I think that story is getting played out across the country. There's a lot of anxiety, nervousness, and, you know, and uncertainty um, uh, about what, what's in store. So it's, it's not a good time to be making a big push to sort of lift us over the, you know, the, uh, the edge of the, you know, um, uh, to the top of the wall. It, but still, uh, I was asked to come talk, and this is what's on my mind, so, <laughs> <laughs> Nancy. So thanks, Mark. Um, I have, I have um, two questions that I think are really related to each other. Um, one is, I guess I'd love to push you a little bit more on what your, what the take home message ought to be. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna, I wanna give you the analogy, and you can tell me whether it's good or terrible, about let's say there were a lot of cuts to the food stamp program, mm -hmm. and we went around and we documented in four sites some really great soup kitchens. Mm -hmm. And we said, and we, and we got, got all these cheese warehouses, let them eat cheese, yeah. Well, no, I don't even mean to let them eat cheese. I mean, look, yeah. so, so there's, a, there's a community that is very community minded. And it says, gosh, we can't let all of our people, now that there's more cuts to the food stamp program, starve. And they develop a lot of food soup kitchen programs, whether they are private out of churches or somehow more public like these. And they demonstrate that they actually are spending less per person on right. food. And, um, and, and you can say, you can call that a good news story because mm -hmm. it's a sense of community, a right. piece, which is, I guess, my second question I really yeah. want to pick up on. Or you could look at it, I guess I'll throw a bias in my view as a real bad news story, uh -huh. um, because if there is truly a sense of community, uh -huh. then we ensure that everyone gets what they need uh -huh. as we design a system from the start, right. rather than only looking downstream. So yeah. I guess I, I want to ask you a little bit more both about what the take home message is supposed to be and what you meant by this um, shared sense of community, mm -hmm. which I understood from your talk, to be what all of the safety net demonstrates. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's true, but it seems that the thing that prompted all of that didn't really demonstrate the sense of community. Right. Well, yes. And, you know, of course, the sense of community is oftentimes hard to <laughs> conjure up. Um, and, um, um, you know, it's, it's a big topic. I mean, I, I Rather than answer that directly, I, I mean, I, 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 let me just, the, the soup kitchen analogy, which is a good one, I, I'm thinking. And, and so, you know, as we think about whether that would be appropriate to do or not, um, um, you know, it, it, I think it's, it, it, it's great imagery, because you can, you can think of sort of that sort of being the noblest, you know, sort of form of kind of direct service labeling out and what have you, versus, you know, the government kind of shirking its responsibilities. And so a lot of the burden on the safety net has come about, and particularly in the counties I'm familiar with in North Carolina, because uh, the counties themselves used to have this legal obligation to provide, and they just sort of walked away from it. They just said, well, nobody's enforcing our legal obligation to, to, to uh, provide for the, the, you know, the indigents, and so we're just, you know, we're just going to move our money out of these uh, clinics and let somebody else pick up the pieces. And so these community health centers and Free clinics and all um, have really gotten uh, uh, hit in, in, in these particular counties I know in, in North Carolina. And 
so the community has kind of had to rally around in different ways. So it, there is a sense in which the, the community in its most sort of uh, explicit political form has, has said, hands off, you know, we want nothing to do with it. But then others from the provider community, from the, from the, from the charitable community, what have you, stepped up and created some of these structures, these volunteer position structures or these uh, sliding scale structures and things like that. So, you know, whether, you know, you draw from that, you know, here's a community that doesn't care, who uh, is heartless and what have you, versus here's a community that does care and is really doing uh, lots of wonderful things. You, you, I mean, both, both stories are true in a way, and, and uh, so, uh, so the world exists in that complex sort of nature. But at the end of the day, I mean, the take home, you know, is this proposal going to do more, more good than harm, and could it harm things? And I've made some people angry by publishing some of this stuff, saying, you know, it's just, you know, the uh, people who want to just block grant Medicaid and, you know, repeal the ACA are just going to run, you know, just their, this, is, this is preaching their message for them. And, you know, it's sort of like, you can put the information out there, you can't control how it's, how it's used. I, I, I do think that, you know, we'd like to see something designed from scratch that sort of provides a sort of a, a at least a, a good baseline for everybody that has this, this, this sense of, of, of uh, inclusive, that, that doesn't have these, these uh, uh, you know, holes in the system. And, but it just, I think the political reality is we're never going to get better than what we, what, what we almost have now, you know, what we almost have now, we may not get at all. So I think my own calculus is it's not the wrong time to put this out there. I mean, the, the ACA will stay in place or not stay in place, regardless of what I have to say, but whatever happens, uh, we sort of gave it the best effort that we could, and that's as far as we're going to get anytime soon. So we might as well go ahead and start to think about the soup kitchen options, because it's not going to realistically foreclose something that, that we're going to like better. Get any closer? Not going to say never, but in, in you know the next you know half a generation or whatever. So, but that's just a very sort of I don't know cynical or sort of um, intuitive kind of uh, personal philosophy, I guess. That I you know, certainly can see where others would differ. Um, so anyway, yeah, a lot a lot in that example <laughs> that I want to chew on some more. Other questions or yes in the back. So I actually have not studied that question. I know others have, um, and so, um, and I actually haven't studied that literature either. So I could just tell you the you know the example of these four examples. That in each one, there's sort of one person who really was sort of this extraordinary leader who helped bring it together, but supported by lots of important institutions where there's a lot of sort of social capital, institutional capital, what have you, that they were very adept at strategically. Of, as well as the fact that uh, these major efforts from uh, HRSA and Robert Wood Johnson uh, provided a lot of the stimulus kind of funding for this as well. So kind of alignment of uh, you know, right person, right place, right time that sort of brought them together. And then how they sustain themselves is a whole other story that, again, I don't really know um, because I haven't studied that, but others have. And, um, there's you know, a lot of happenstance. So the idea that you could take these ideas and really scale them up and make them sustainable on a national basis is, is really pretty naive because we know that certainly others have tried and, and that these are sort of the exceptions to the rule that you, these things usually don't get up or don't last or whatever or don't get scaled up to size. Um, but then again, I felt like nobody had really sort of shown the street light or spotlight or whatever on the examples that did, you know, uh, it's sort of like, Find the AIDS vaccine by finding the 100 million person that somehow uh, you know uh, is, is uh, doesn't die from HIV. Then it's like okay, let's learn from that. So so maybe that's uh, that's sort of the natural uh, sort of ecology of this project. Yes. You presented uh, what looked like cross-sectional data on the the cost effectiveness and the ability to provide access. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of what the trends are over time, especially more recently? Uh, I don't. Randomized people at the safety net, but somehow I don't think the IRB will let us. So, uh, anyway. uh, so um, yeah. nope, just, this is kind of just the first shot of this question. I don't think anybody's kind of 
lined it up this way before, so I took kind of the first snapshot, and you know, funders get interested, and I'm happy to do it again. And <laughs> but right now, it's not that hot a topic. So, ACA gets uh, struck down or repealed, it might, I might be sitting pretty. We'll see. <laughs> Come back to me in two months, and we'll, we'll form a we'll form a good research team. So, uh, you don't want to wish for that. So. <laughs> Where, what you wish for. So, all right, Jeff, I think we're, we're done. Yep. Anybody else? One last question oh. before we go. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, so, you, you pointed out um, somewhat parenthetically that the, the model institutions you're looking at also serve undocumented immigrants, and I understand it was parenthetical because you had already bracketed, bracketed mm -hmm. the undocumented population upstream in the thoughts. But it is, it is one of the more attractive attributes of those places from a certain point of view, ethically. Um, and I was wondering if there were some more overtly national or um, government-associated effort to scale up this kind of program, whether there would then be political pressure on such institutions to take a stand yes, on, yeah, on documented immigrants yeah. that, that might yeah. be a, a bad thing. Yes, no, it's a, it's a very difficult issue. I, I, I don't see a way forward on that that, uh, uh, you know, that I'm comfortable with or that uh, I think uh, is going to sort of uh, create a consensus that is going to be you know, easy, easily uh, you know, uh, built on or disseminated. So I, I do think uh, that that's a, a particular issue that requires a lot more sort of careful thought and um, um, strategizing and what have you. And I, it's, uh, so, um, you know, what I'm suggesting is something in a way of approaching things more at a community level, and where you need the national, the state of national resources to make it happen. Um, I mean, so far, th this has not been a problem for the FQHCs, um, and their premise has been, well, we just don't ask people to bring their wrong with you and you know how much money you bring. And um, and that's gone fine so far. And their funding is you know doubled, tripled, quadrupled, what have you. So so there's a model for saying this this, this can go ahead. Um, although there's worry in that community that some at some point this is gonna flash back on them. It's the same the way that the abortion issue uh, flashed back on them. The whole hold up the last minute of voting for the Affordable Care Act with the Stupac amendment and the sort of baby killer shouting and all that kind of stuff, specifically related to whether it was possible that someday FQACs might someday do abortions. And even though they don't, they never would, and it would be so stupid that there's nothing in the law that prohibits them from doing that. So, so they became a flashpoint for that political issue, almost to the extent that it blew up the Affordable Care Act. And Obama signed an executive order that says, thou shalt not do abortions. So it's there, now it's the law, and then there's this whole debate about is the executive order really, the, this is all what went down on that Sunday as you were watching the debate. But it's an example of how, you know, something that had sort of wasn't supposed to be an issue became an issue. On the other hand, it's sort of surprising that the uh, access for undoc undocumented to the FQHCs has not yet become an issue. And so maybe there's a success there that could be learned from and built on. But then again, I'm afraid to study it because I don't want to call any attention to this. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, it's something to be said in favor of the more sociologically organic soup kitchen model. But yeah. if, if that's the way that's motivated in terms of political will, yeah. rather than occurring officially under the auspices of government programs, then those organizations retain a lot more discretion yeah. to do as they please. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. And you can't, you can't uh, right, criticize it. But that would be sort of a more block granny sort of thing, which, yeah. again, um, is, is a way of, of possibly so some really astute, you know, political social scientists could should really come up with a couple of good ideas for us here. So mm -hmm. anybody in the room? Any takers? PhD in the in the offing. Okay. Yes. All right. Thanks everybody for coming and thanks Mark for uh, a great talk.